Well, as we continue our Who's Your One emphasis, I invite you to open your Bible to Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Luke 5, 1 through 11, that's page 913 in the Pew Bible. So feel free to use that if you don't have your Bible with you. And if you don't own a Bible, feel free to take that Bible home with you when you go. <clears throat> some of you remember Flip Wilson, a comedian from some years ago. He used to say when asked about his religious preference that he was a Jehovah's bystander. He said they wanted me to be a Jehovah's witness, but I don't want to get that involved. If you want to follow Jesus, you're going to have to get involved. He doesn't call disciples to hide in a corner. He doesn't cause it, call us to be quiet about our faith. Listen to this story of Jesus calling in his first, of his first disciples in the word of the Lord. As the crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear God's word, he was standing by Lake Gennesaret. He saw two boats at the edge of the lake. The fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, which belonged to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the land. Then he sat down and was teaching the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Master Simon replied, we've worked hard all night long and caught nothing. But if you say so, I'll let down the nets. When they did this, they caught a great number of fish and their nets began to tear. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. They came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me because I am a sinful man, Lord. For he and all those with him were amazed at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, Zebedee's sons, who were Simon's partners. Don't be afraid, Jesus told Simon. From now on, you will be catching people. Then they brought the boats to land, left everything, and followed him. The house that I finished growing up in was situated on a bluff overlooking Roark Creek, a creek that had some pretty good trout in it. And more times than I can count after school or maybe on a Sunday after church, I'd grab my fishing pole, tackle box, and I'd head down to the creek. I'd walk down the hill, get on Highway 65, turn left, walk to Roark Bridge, go down under the bridge, climb down that bluff, get on the railroad tracks, and walk about a half a mile west to my spot. I'd set up and and more often than not, I would come home with at least two or three trout on my stringer. I loved to fish. But somewhere along the way, I pretty much quit fishing. I don't know why exactly. Maybe I got busy with other things. You know how it is. School, work, um, sports. You just run out of time. Or maybe I quit catching fish. And I'm the kind of person that if the fish aren't biting, I have a hard time maintaining interest. But for whatever reason, I wasn't interested in going fishing anymore. Simon Peter had at least one experience like that. He'd been out on the Lake of Gennesaret, which is just another name for the Sea of Galilee, been out there all night long and had come up empty. They tried one place after the other. His partners would cast the nets here and cast the nets there, only to drag in a net full of broken pottery and slimy seaweed and a few fish so scrawny they just threw them back into the lake. Frustrated and empty-handed, they put ashore at morning's light and set about the fishermen's work of washing and mending their nets. They had to make ready for yet another night at sea, a more profitable one, they hoped, because they weren't fishing for fun. They were fishing for a living. And it was a beautiful morning. The sun rising in the east cast that long glow across rippling waters and, and birds calling and squawking, flying around the boats, hoping some generous fisherman might give them a piece of last night's catch. In some ways, it was like any morning, but in another way, it was very different because a crowd had gathered right there at the shore. And Jesus was there, and he was teaching them. And as they were pushing and shoving, trying to press in against Jesus, uh, Jesus began to back away until he was up to his ankles in the water. He finally asked Simon, could I use your boat for a pulpit? Sure. So Simon let him get aboard. They pushed out just a little bit from the shore, and there on a boat rocking gently to the waves, Jesus, using that natural amplification of the water, taught the crowd a bit more. Simon Peter listened. 
He'd not known Jesus for very long, but he was intrigued by Jesus. Jesus had been a guest in his home. While he was there, Jesus had healed Simon Peter's mother-in-law from what was a raging fever. And when word got out where Jesus was staying, well, the front porch of Simon's house looked like the ER on waiting room on the 4th of July. Packed, packed, packed. From all over those parts, the sick, the demon-possessed, came to see if Jesus would help them. Well, he would help them, and he did help them. And so Simon had seen Jesus in action. He had seen Jesus do things that he had never seen anyone do before. And now he was listening to him teach. As Jesus taught, Simon continued working with his nets, but listening all the while to the compelling things that Jesus said. And after a bit, Jesus put the amen on his lesson for the day, and he turned to Simon, and he said, Simon, let's go fishing, and I know the perfect spot. Now, asking a professional fisherman like Simon to fish when he'd already been at it all night is like a plumber's wife asking him to unclog the seat when he gets home from uh, work. Not an attractive offer. So Simon put forth a mild protest. Master, we've, we've worked all night, didn't catch anything. But because you say so, I'll let out the nets. So they made their way to deeper water and Jesus said here Simon this looks just about right drop the nets and do some fishing Jesus reclined in the stern of the boat looking at Peter with a wry smile the kind of smile a person has on his face when he's about ready to surprise a friend and while the text doesn't elaborate you can only imagine that Simon Peter was mumbling some things under his breath Let's go fishing, huh? I can't, I can't believe I'm doing this. I just got my nets put up for crying out loud. And yet here I am taking fishing advice from a carpenter. Well, I'm the fisherman. I know this lake like the back of my hand. And if I couldn't find anything all night long, I'm sure I'm not going to find anything this morning. If I didn't feel like somehow I owe him, I would just go home, go to bed. And as Simon and his companions lowered the net, he turned back to look at Jesus, who gave him a wink and a smile and two thumbs up signs. And no sooner did the nets hit the water than Simon realized he'd struck gold. He'd lowered his net into the biggest school of fish he'd ever seen in his life. The nets started to fill and stretch and rip and tear, a little here and a little there, and the calm turned into frantic activity. With eyes as big as saucers, his heart racing, Simon started barking out orders, grab it in the middle, don't let it break. Someone tighten up the end, pull, men, pull and they strained and they groaned to pull in the catch and as the net started coming up the side you can see a crew member or two grabbing fish and throwing them over their head fish flopping around on the deck Peter finally shook free long enough to whistle and wave to his partners James and John to come help they came and both boats were so full that they began to sink in all their years of fishing man this was the mother load and when things finally settled down, Simon Peter fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. What an odd thing to say after catching the biggest net of fish in your life. Now, what we would expect him to say is something like, wow, not bad for a beginning fisherman. Or, thanks for making my month. Or, do you know any other good spots we could fish? But Simon said nothing of the sort. He realized that this catch was not beginner's luck on Jesus' part, that this was an act of God. And struck with the fear of the Lord, Simon fell at Jesus' knees, go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. But Jesus didn't go away. Instead, he replied, don't be afraid from now on, you're going to be catching people. And right then and there, on the spur of the moment, Simon, Peter, James, and John left their boats, their nets, and everything else on the spur of the moment and went with Jesus to fix for fish for folks instead of fish. Some call, huh? Well, he's calling us too. He's calling you. It's time to go fishing for folks. Throughout history, the church has understood that when Jesus called Peter, James, and John to be fishers of people, he wasn't just calling them, he was calling the church. He's calling you, he's calling me to fish for souls, to cast gospel nets and catch men and women, boys and girls for Christ. That's why we're asking you 
to fish for one of the lost friends or family members that Jesus has put on your heart. Picture Jesus putting a gospel net into your hand, pointing out a person he loves and you know, and saying, her, fish for her, him, fish for him. But for any number of reasons, many of us aren't too keen about fishing for folks, kind of like some of the ones in the video we saw. Did you cast your net and it came back empty and you've just given up? Maybe you're afraid of this kind of fishing. Maybe you don't particularly like the person for whom Jesus has called you to fish. Some Christians will look at their lives and they'll say, well, I'm no poster boy for the Christian faith. I've got a long way to go myself. Who am I to fish for folks? There's plenty of Christians who never fish for folks. Are you one of them? Do you not hear Jesus call? Do you not believe that Jesus is Lord? The disciples heard, John heard, and responded to Jesus. But some of us never cast a net, never have a gospel conversation. Some of us haven't even tried. But remember, it is the Lord who calls us to fish for folks. He is the one who put a gospel net in the hands of one of his disciples, pointed to you and said, fish for him. That disciple obeyed and Jesus fished you out of your lostness. And he puts a gospel net in our hands and he says, fish over there. The Lord calls us, so even if we're not too keen on fishing, we do it because as Simon uh, said to Jesus, because you say so, I will let down the nets. Fishing for souls, bearing witness for Jesus, it's not a matter of convenience, it's not a take it or leave it option, it's a matter of obedience. So the Lord says church, and even more particularly, he says, he says Lance, he, he, he says Kyle, he says Jake, Go and fish for her. Go and fish for him. That disciple obeyed. And now he's calling all of us to go fishing. And many of us say in reply, Lord, I'm afraid. I'm inadequate. Lord, I'm unworthy. I'm no fisherman, Lord. And that's okay. Go ahead and voice your protest. Simon did. But like Simon, get past the, get past the protest to obedience because you say so. I will let down the nets. And that's really all we have to do in fishing for folks. We cast the gospel net. Jesus is the one who catches the fish. We cast the net by praying for our one, by sharing the gospel, by speaking God's word into this world, by speaking words like sin and grace and salvation and eternal life and repent and believe and follow. When we let people know that God loves them, that he has dealt with their sin problem through the death and resurrection of his sinless son, Jesus, we are casting gospel nets. And, and when we cast that net, no telling who God will catch. He caught a bunch of us, didn't he? He caught you. So our task in fishing is simple. Share the good news and let Jesus take care of the results. We do it rather indiscriminately by and large. But in this season, we are asking you to choose one person who needs Jesus and go fishing for him or for her. Just as Peter knew without a doubt that it was Jesus who put those fish in the net, so we who bear witness for Christ know that he's the one who puts the fish in our net too. It's time to go fishing for folks. And the beautiful thing is that we don't all have to fish the exact same way. I mean, pick up Field and Stream magazine, you're going to probably find articles in there about several ways to, to fish, variety of ways. Some fishermen, they like to use the bobber, you know, that sits there on the water. Some like to let the bait just lay at the bottom well, until some lazy catfish comes along and snatches it up. Others use trot lines. Some like to fly fish. Some like to snag spoonbills. And some fish like my kids and I did when they were little. We'd go to Dick Taylor's Pond He'd throw in catfish food. We'd cast in a hook immediately, caught fish anytime we wanted. But fishermen fish in different ways, sometimes depending on the fish, sometimes depending on the fishermen. But this is what they all have in common. They all fish. Now, your personality is probably going to impact the way you fish for folks. The bold will probably be bold. You may be one of those ready, fire, aim people. You don't have a great filter, 
Uh, you just pretty much spout what you're thinking. With, you're bold. And if you are bold, would you take that with you when you share the gospel? If, you're, if your one is a bold person, they will appreciate your direct approach. If you're bold, be bold. Maybe you're the intellectual type. You like to take apart the gospel and see how it ticks. You like to understand not just what you believe, but why you believe it. And if that's who you are, fish for folks like that. Engage their questions. Explore their doubts. If you're an intellectual, fish for folks that way. Maybe you're more of a touchy-feely type. Uh, you will find it easier to share your uh, Jesus story in a testimonial way. You may not know all the answers or even all the questions, but you know this, you once were lost, but now you're found. You once were blind, but now you see. Uh, you once were dead in your sins, but now you're alive in Christ Jesus. Share that. Share how Jesus' story changed your story. Maybe you're very shy. Well, could you at least invite your one to come with you to your connect group, to worship, or to sit down with you in a more vocal Christian? Your friend will hear the gospel, and you will be emboldened to join in the sharing. You just need a little help. While we need to learn to share the gospel with our one, invitational evangelism is a way. It's a way to start. And maybe you're more of a doer than a, than a talker. You want to let your good works tell the story. I'll do good deeds and people can see Jesus in that. You want to let them tell the story. Well, I'm telling you right now, your good deeds will not tell the story. So do not settle for that. But if you'll let your good deeds, if you'll leverage those to point people to Jesus, then all kinds of gospel conversations can open up. Pastor Cho in South Korea instructs the people of his church what they're supposed to say when they do their intentional acts of kindness uh, to people. That's part of their church's small group evangelism strategy. When asked by those who are blessed by them, why do you do these things? They say, I'm a disciple of Jesus. I'm serving him by serving you because that's what he came to do. And all of a sudden, a gospel conversation is opened. It's a non-offensive response and a door opener and a conversation starter. You can leverage that, but don't just depend on good works. People do not become Christians by osmosis. It doesn't just rub off of you onto them. There has to be the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, says the Bible. We've been training you on the three-circle approach. You've got some of that on Wednesday night, a way of sharing the gospel. The first circle is God's design, that God designed the world in perfection and harmony and beauty. But I usually, like Kyle mentioned Wednesday, like to start more with the second circle, brokenness. Because if there's one thing that everybody can agree on, it's that uh, the world is broken. War, violence, corrupt politics, sickness, family strife, all kinds of brokenness. And this might be a place to meet your one because almost everybody agrees the world is broken and most of us are willing to admit that there's brokenness inside of us. So we can share with them how God didn't intend for it to be this way, but our sinfulness has wrecked his perfect design. And that's when we can introduce Jesus and the gospel, that God has fixed the brokenness of our sin by providing his sinless son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins, to be raised from the dead in victory over sin and death. And then you can say something like this to your one, you cannot fix your brokenness by yourself, but because God loves you, he provided a way to fix it. If you will repent, turn from your sin, and believe that what Jesus did on the cross, he did for you then you can be saved and as you follow him you can let him begin the process of restoring your life with purpose as you pursue God's design in all areas of your life then you can invite your one to make a decision to put their trust in Jesus don't forget to press and ask for a decision you need to know where they stand with the gospel uh, you need to know if it's a yes or a no or I think I just need a little more time. Now you can do this. You can share the gospel with your one. You're not alone in the process. Jesus is with you and the Holy Spirit is working in ways you both can see and can't see and he wants to use your witness to help someone come to know and follow Jesus. He wants to use you for this. Jesus calls us to fish for folks. 
Some are better at it than others. Some are more natural at it than others. But all of us, you, me, all of us called to cast the gospel net into the sea of lostness that surrounds us. We're asking you to do this intentionally with your one. It's the same gospel, but we might do it in some different ways. That's okay. Evangelist D.L. Moody once responded to, in this way, to a critic of his evangelistic methods. He said, it may not be the best way, but I like my way of doing it better than your way of not doing it. You do it. You go fish for your one. It's time. It's time to fish for folks. Listen to a parable. It came to pass that a group existed who called themselves fishermen. And there were many fish in the waters all around them. In fact, the whole area was surrounded with streams and lakes just full of fish, and the fish were hungry. Week after week, month after month, year after year, those who called themselves fishermen assembled together and talked about their call to fish. They also talked about the abundance of fish, how they might go about the fishing. They carefully defined what fishing is and what it means. They defended it as an occupation. They declared fishing was their primary reason for existence. And these fishermen built large, beautiful headquarters for fishing. Courses were offered there on the needs of the fish, the nature of the fish, how to define fish, psychological reactions of fish, how to go about fishing. And the plea went out that everyone should be a fisherman and every fisherman should fish just one glaring problem. You know what it is, don't you? Nobody ever fished. Nobody ever fished. It's time to fish for folks. It's time to fish for your one. 